Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to another Australian Water School webinar brought to you each week by IceWarm. This webinar series explores the grand ideas flowing, flowing, no, they're gushing. Yeah, they're gushing out of the global water sector. Today we present another grand idea. Well, way beyond an idea. This has been years in the making. The topic today is the Atlas of Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems and be presented by Ben De Gregorio and Eloise Nation from Australia's Bureau of Meteorology. We're so glad you could join us. My name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager at IceWarm and we'll be chairing today's webinar. Uh, but you know, the great thing is that so many of you joined us and thank you for, for coming on early and all over the world, you can see way up north of, yes, well, Finland or Norway. W welcome. And I spoke earlier with uh, Daniela from Chile and a PhD researcher in USA. So, yes, thank you. This is spread right across the globe and there's very, very big um, um, a group of attendees today. Thank you for joining us. There's our training courses coming up and free webinars, I should say. Um, I won't go into each one, but you can see there's a, a host of them coming up between now and Christmas and some online courses there in surface water modelling and sustainable development. So today, Ben and Eloise, uh, Ben De Gregorio is a hydrogeologist with the Bureau of Meteorology, having joined the team this year. Ben's responsible for managing and updating the GDE Atlas and serves as the Secretariat of the GDE Reference Group. Has spent 10 years working in consulting companies, England and Australia. Ben has worked in many aspects of groundwater, including resource management, mining, environmental monitoring, infrastructure projects, undertaken several spatial mapping projects and completed a master's in spatial information at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University in 2016. So that's a great background and we're really glad you can join us, Ben, and your colleague Eloise, a senior hydrogeologist at the Bureau of Meteorology. There'll be plenty of questions. So having two heads uh, working on this will be a really good thing, I'm sure. Where are you located today? Uh, they were in, well, sunny Melbourne. That's good. It's sunny there, right? That's good. That's always good. Um, um, and look, uh, I don't know quite who you're expecting would be along today. I've looked through the attendee lists. There's researchers, consultants, uh, natural resource planners, the sort of group that you normally deal with, Eloise? Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly. Um, we, we've sort of done some feedback surveys and that sort of thing just to get a feel for who our our users are and yep. usually yep. it's um, private consultants in engineering yep. and um, environment. They're usually the biggest portion followed pretty closely by government and then research is a bit under yep. that as well. Yeah, yeah. But I think this is one of our first opportunities to talk to an international audience. Yeah. So Quite exciting for us. And yeah. there is a lot of internationals on board today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. You must be incredibly late or early, wherever you are, from Chile to um, Europe uh, and everything in between. Uh, New Zealand. <laughs> I won't start mentioning countries. <laughs> um, uh, that, that's really good. How long is this atlas? I, I've just been thinking about this. I, I've seen a little bit of it, but not enough. How long has it been developing for? What, years? I've said years in my intro. So I think... Um, Eight years ago, they started developing the Atlas and it went yeah. live about six years ago. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's been That's a long time in the making. And massive amounts of data, I understand. Yeah, Huge uh, amounts. I won't, yeah, I won't hold up any, any, any further. I'll hand straight over to you, Ben and, and Eloise. Uh, present to us what, uh, take us where you will, and that'll be absolutely fantastic. And there'll be some questions along the way, I'm sure. Uh, but right over to you now, we're in your hands. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Trevor. Um, we'll probably just say goodbye to Eloise for the time. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be back for Q&A to help me. But um, I'm just going to slowly right. cut her out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just bear with me while I set up my PowerPoint. Yep, that's coming through now. That's good. Yep, great. Okay, so I jump straight into it. Um, so as Trevor mentioned, I'm going to be talking talking to you about groundwater dependent ecosystems or GDEs um, because we like to shorten things around here um, and in particular we'll talk about the GDE atlas that we just mentioned before. Um, so I'll just start with a quick outline so I'll define what they are just to make sure we're all on the same page um, and then I'll just talk a bit about why they're important and you know why we should care about them. Um, then I'm just going to go over what the atlas actually is 
um, and how the GDEs were actually classified on there. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about how they were mapped and the methodology behind it. Um, and then I'll kind of take it home with a bit of a case study where I run through a lot of the tools that are on the Atlas and how you can use them in your assessment. Um, and then I'm just going to finish off by talking about, you know, just some of the work that we're doing to keep the Atlas relevant going forward. Um, so what is a groundwater dependent ecosystem? It is an ecosystem that requires groundwater to meet all or some of their water requirements to maintain the communities of plants and animals, ecological processes and ecosystem services. Um, so that's really just a long-winded way of saying that um, if any ecosystem that requires access to groundwater in order to function properly. Um, and so the groundwater can feed it all the time, it can be intermittent, uh, it can supply the entire volume of water or just a component, doesn't matter. As long as there is that requirement for groundwater, then it's a GDE. Um, and so when we talk about GDEs, we're talking about things ranging from rivers and lakes, wetlands, we're talking about vegetation that accesses the groundwater via its root, um, as well as caves and aquifers. And so this image that you see here, this is Bitter Springs in the Northern Territory, um, that's a GDE and, you know, quite a popular tourist destination in the Northern Territory. Uh, so now, why are they important? Well, there's a few reasons. So the first is for ecological reasons. Um, they can purify water and degrade pollutants. They can mitigate the effects of flooding. They can reduce soil erosion and sediment and nutrient loss. And it also provides a habitat for flora and fauna, uh, many of which are critically endangered and they rely on that ecosystem to survive. Uh, the second reason is economic. So um, it provides water for plants and animal production. Um, and, you know, you think about the agriculture and farming in, in the country as quite a big contributor to the economy. Um, it provides tourism opportunities. Uh, an obvious example is Kakadu. Um, you think about all the tourism dollars that brings in, it's world famous. And it also provides water for human consumption as well. Um, and then the third reason is cultural. So it provides recreational opportunities. So if you've ever gone fishing or you've camped by a river or you've you know, been on a boat in a lake, chances are you've interacted with the GDE for recreational purposes. And secondly, it also a number of sites of cultural significance for the indigenous population are GDEs. Um, so one example is Catherine River um, and Catherine Gorge, that area. That, that feeds a lot of sites of cultural significance for the indigenous population. Uh, so with that in mind, um, you know, it's really important to, that we understand GDEs whenever we're making any water planning decisions. So things such as allocating environmental surface water flows, um, groundwater abstraction licenses, you know, before issuing those, we really need to understand what the what the GDEs are and what the impacts could be. Um, and also for development such as, you know, new mines or just large scale development, environmental imp impact assessment, they're required uh, just to really understand the impacts that could happen to the GDEs and how they could best be mitigated. And then the third area is research. So as shown by the number of you that have actually joined um, from the research sector, it's actually a really big area at the moment with a lot of research happening um, and our understanding of GDEs is evolving quite rapidly and the GDE Atlas is a really valuable resource for this. Um, so now I'm just going to quickly touch on the groundwater information suite that we have on the Bureau of Meteorology's website. Um, so this page that you see here, you can actually access it if you go to the link bomb.gov.au forward slash water forward slash groundwater. Um, and so my colleague, John Sharples, he did a webinar talk a few months back now um, with ISWOM on all of the products and just gave a bit of a high level overview. Um, so that is online. Um, so if you're interested, definitely go check that out. And then my colleague, Aloise, who you just saw earlier, um, she gave a talk on the Groundwater Explorer and that's also available um, on the ISWOM website as well. But we're here to talk about groundwater-dependent ecosystems atlas. 
So I will just jump straight into it. So the GDE Atlas is Australia's only national inventory of GDE. Um, and it's quite world leading. There's not many, if any countries I know of, that actually have an online repository nationwide of GDEs, um, you know, for, for a whole country. And so the data is made freely available to the public. It can be downloaded. Um, you can do anything you want with it, all your kind of offline analysis. Um, you just have to go, I provided a link at the bottom here. Um, you just go there and that'll take you to the map and you can download and extract data. Um, if you wanted a lot of data, you could email us at groundwater at bomb.gov.au and we can certainly help you out there. Um, so the Atlas has actually been named as a really important resource um, by a joint, I guess a joint committee of um, state and Commonwealth ag government agencies. They developed the National Groundwater Strategic Framework um, I think a year or two ago, um, and particularly in the area of optimising groundwater resources, they said that the GDE Atlas has a really important role to play in that. And also the Independent Expert Scientific Committee for Coal Seam Gas um, Mining, they've also, they're releasing an explanatory note on assessing GDE, and um, they've, they've referred to the GDE Atlas quite a lot, um, you know, for anyone who wants to assess GDE. And that, that's in draft form at the moment, but that will be released soon. Um, and so it is a valuable resource for water planners and environmental managers for the reasons I outlined before, you know, things such as water planning decisions and impact assessments. Um, and in particular, it's really useful for flagging potential GDEs in the early stages of planning and approval. And then, you know, once you've got an idea of what GDEs might be out there, you might want to follow the follow that up with some field work um, and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a few different types of GDEs that are on the atlas. So they've been broadly classified into three groups. We've got aquatic, terrestrial and subterranean. Um, and this figure I got from the Queensland government website. Um, and it's a really good figure that sort of shows the different GDE habitats that you might find. So things such as lakes and rivers and caves and wetlands. Um, I'm going to go through that in a bit more detail in the following slides. So the first one I want to talk to you about is aquatic GDE. So this is the surface expression of groundwater. Um, and so that basically means once the groundwater has entered the surface, um, then it's considered an aquatic GDE. So when we talk about aquatic GDEs, we're talking about things like springs, lakes, rivers, rivers and wetlands. Um, and so if we go back to this figure, you can see these sort of diagrams here. So we've got the lakes, which is being fed by this sort of um, localised water table to the left, um, and then the rivers. And then we've got, yeah, different examples of wetlands. So all those things the arrows are pointing to. The second one is terrestrial um, GDE. So this refers to subsurface presence of groundwater. So that's really just vegetation that is accessing groundwater via its root. And so, again, if we refer to this diagram, we're talking about riverine habitats um, along the side of rivers. We're talking about just general vegetation that's accessing the groundwater and also estuarine habitats as well. And then the third one is subterranean GDEs. So this is caves and aquifers. And so we've actually got pretty limited coverage of this at the moment because when the atlas was first developed, um, a huge national assessment was done across the entire country, but they only did it for terrestrial and for aquatic GDEs. So we've um, actually collaborated with some of the state agencies to get that um, subterranean data on the atlas, and we are looking to increase that coverage over time. And so we do quite a bit of collaboration with all the different GDE data custodians to try and keep that um, data up to date and relevant going forward. And so again, if we look at the diagram, we're talking about the caves here, um, and we're talking about aquifers. And so I think that picture that you see of the aquifer GDE, that's Stigophorna, which is sort of, you know, little organisms that live in the aquifers. Um, and so now I'm just going to talk a bit about 
how the GDA is actually mapped um, to get them on the Atlas. So as I mentioned briefly before, there was a national study that was done, um, and this was done in about 2010, 11, 2012. Um, it's a very long study, um, and that was done by SKM and CSIRO. Um, and so that report that you see on your left, or right, I can't really work it out, but um, that, that's on our Bureau website. Um, I've included the link at the bottom below. So if you go to the About page on the GDE Atlas, um, there's a methodology tab and you can sort of get a really thorough overview of how these GDEs were mapped. Um, but I'm going to try my best to condense it into a very small nutshell. Um, so if you look at this um, flow chart that you see um, on the other side of the slide, um, the way it was done was that they started off with a bit of a literature review, you know, just seeing, surveying the landscape, seeing what was out there, um, what data was available, particularly in GIS. Um, and so once they had a good feel for this, then they divided the country up into biogeographic regions um, that had broadly similar physical characteristics. And the way they kind of went about it was that they said, you know, this, this, if this region had a similar, a broadly similar, um, then the predictors of GDEs for that region um, will be the same. And so based on this, they developed a number of different GIS rules using different lines of evidence. Um, and then they weighted them all according to that area. Um, and then they used that to calculate the potential for that site to be a GDE. So, I should, I should note now that all the GDEs in the national assessment were on potential, so they went from high down to low. Um, none of them are actually definitively confirmed with the GDE. Um, so you can sort of look at that potential to have a feel for the confidence. Um, and then subsequent to this, um, we've done a few regional updates, so, and these are both known and potential GDEs. Um, and to do this, you know, we've worked really closely with different GDE data custodians. So a lot of the state agencies and the water agencies, and we've established a bit of a reference group with them. So we work really closely. It's really collaborative because we, we all want to see the Atlas kept up to date and, you know, um, living up to its full potential, I guess, going forward. Um, and so you can see from this map here um, in that screenshot, We've done updates in the Northern Territory, Queensland, New South Wales, and a bit of Victoria and South Australia as well. Um, and at the moment, we are currently doing an update in WA and another one for Queensland. So now I'm going to jump into the case study. I, I think the best way to show you um, all the tools and the features of the Atlas is to actually just run through a bit of a demonstration of a case study that you could potentially be doing. Um, and this is all completely made up, so if anything looks familiar, there's nothing happening in your region that I know of. It's just um, for the sake of this um, case study that I've developed. Um, the case study, I guess the scenario is a quarry is going to be expanded and they need to do an environmental impact assessment. And as part of that, they need to consider what are the GDEs in the area um, and you know, how, how they can be managed. Um, so obviously the first thing you're going to do is to find your site area. So um, I've just put a lovely little red box around it. This is the GDE Atlas interface, I should say. So um, yeah, you've got your toolbar at the top and the layers to the left, as I said. Um, and we've got the satellite imagery shown over the top, um, but we do have different base layers as well. So you can put your land use or you can have surface geology um, or elevation, a whole number of things. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is turn on my aquatic GDE layer. Um, and now before I jump into that, I am going to talk a bit about um, the different colours. Um, that was one of the questions before. So all the ones in purple, the different shades of purple are all from subsequent regional studies. And the darker colours are higher potential GDEs. And then as you get lighter, then that's when we've got a bit less confidence in them. Um, and then it's the same with the blue one, but that's from the national assessment. So the darker the colour, the higher um, the potential to be a GDA. And so you can see from, you know, just this screenshot here, we've got to the northwest, 
we have a river, and that's been assessed as a high potential GDA in a national assessment. To the south, southeast, um, we have a lake, and that was also assessed as high potential, but that was in a regional study. So um, because that's more detailed work and probably involves field work, we probably have a bit more confidence in that data than we would in something from the national assessment. Um, now I'm just turning on the terrestrial layer. So again, they're classified in a similar way, regional studies and national, and known down to low potential GDAs. And you can see that the, the, the riverine habitat to the northwest and the sort of lakeside vegetation to the southeast. Um, and there's a few pockets around as well. Um, and that's all from the national assessment and it's been assessed as um, moderate potential GDA. Um, and then the third layer I'm going to show you is inflow dependent ecosystem. So this is a study that was done by CSIRO um, a few years back. And what inflow dependence refers to is an ecosystem that requires or that accesses water other than rainfall. So it could be subsurface flow, it could be irrigation, or it could be groundwater. Um, and it could be that we, there just wasn't enough information for us to conclusively say there is a GDE in the area. Um, but based in, in general, the higher the inflow dependence, the higher the likelihood that it could be a GDE. Um, and you can see at this site, um, there's quite high, high likelihood of it being inflow dependent. And you can see the sort of darker areas in this map, in the screenshot, sort of correspond to the remote sensing um, or satellite imagery data, those greener areas. And so the study was done using satellite imagery. Um, so now I'm just going to play a bit of a video for you and I'm going to invade over the top. Um, it can get a little bit fast, so I'm going to try and pause the um, opportune moments. Um, but yeah, basically I'm just going to run through the different tools that um, the Atlas has. So we've got um, the satellite imagery, we've got some bores showing, um, and we've got the hydrology. We've got a bunch of layers such as groundwater management areas, <clears throat> um, and that's the hydrology I spoke about. So the bores are classified based on their different uses. We've also got groundwater flow system, surface geology, and a, a whole range of environmental contextual layers, so things such as land use, vegetation, bioregions. Um, but now I'm just going to turn on the terrestrial GDA layer, um, and I'm just going to zoom into the site. I'll put that red box around it again. So the first thing I'm going to do is just measure how far the nearest GDA is. So you can see it's about one kilometre away. And we can also just bring up basic information about the GDEs too. So I'm just clicking this and you get this pop-up box and it tells you the IDA likelihood, um, the potential to be a GDE and, you know, the ecosystem type, that kind of information. Um, one of the features that I really like about the Atlas is you can actually download um, a map that you can use in your reports or your assessments and that kind of thing. So um, you just click that icon that was up before um, and it generates the map for you automatically. Um, and I'm just going to open that up now. So, you know, it has your legend, it has all your cartographic features, such as your scale bar, et cetera. Um, so that's just a really nifty tool for your reporting and analysis. Um, and then, you know, you might want to select everything within a certain area. So this is about three kilometer diameter. And then it brings up this table at the bottom and that's got all your sort of basic information. And then you can actually go into a more detailed view of the results as well. Um, which has a bit of extra information about aquifer properties and geology, that sort of thing. Um, you can export this information. So I'm doing it as a CSV. We also have the option of HTML or Excel file. Um, and I'm just bringing that up now. So again, that's just got the data that I showed you before, the uh, potential, your yeah, ecosystem type, and um, aquifer properties, if they're available as well. Um, but you might want to download this data as geospatial data. So we also have that option too, which I'm going to go through now. So just clearing that selection. Um, and you can download all the data that within a river region. So I'm just turning on that layer now. And you can see this is in the Hopkins River. And um, so if we just search for that river region and select the format, 
Um, so we've got the option of file geodatabase, we've got shape files, and we've got KML files. So I'm just downloading it as a file geodatabase. I'm just going to open that up in our catalog. So it's really good to do your own offline analysis um, and overlay it with your own data. So you've got your metadata, which you know tells you all that basic information about the data set, um, things such as licensing um, and how the layer was developed. Um, and the geodatabase has the three different GDA layers, so terrestrial, subterranean, aquatic, just going into terrestrial now. Um, so you've got that sort of spatial view, where the cursor is, that's um, where the site is. Um, then we can turn that over into table view. And you can say we've got about 40, 47,000 records, so it's a really big data set. Um, nationally, I think we've got about 4 million different polygons. Um, Within, within the terrestrial data set alone. So it's a really, really humongous database. Um, but yeah, it's got all that kind of basic information and then some. Um, so yeah, you've got your hydrological information, you've got your geology, geology information, um, you've got your contextual information. So it's really useful for doing your own research. You can lay your own data over it um, and sort of, yeah, just have a play with it and modify it as you need. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about before I hand it over for Q and A is just um, the work that we're doing to keep the atlas relevant. So we recognise the importance of the atlas as a really um, beneficial kind of resource for the industry um, and the country at large. So there's actually no funding for development works and kind of making those updates. So we really rely on generating partnerships with different government and state agencies. Um, and a, so to that end, we've developed a reference group and we're actually meeting next week. We meet every six months um, and we kind of just share information about, you know, new data that's being collected, what are new developments that are happening in this field. Um, and, you know, it's a really passionate group and there's a lot of goodwill and everyone, you know, really excited to, you know, be the Atlas continue to be the best that it can be. Um, and they provide a lot of really important advice on, you know, update to the Atlas and improvements that we can make to the functionality and make it better for users. Um, and so I will just finish by saying we're always looking for feedback. So if you've used the Atlas and, you know, there's something you would like to see on there or ways you think it could be improved, please do get in touch with us. Our email is groundwater at bomb.gov.au. Um, so, yeah, I'll probably just hand it back to you now, Trevor, for some ben, Q &A. That, That's been fantastic, Ben. We really yeah, appreciate that. Bring Aloise in as well yeah, now. Aloise, <laughs> do, do that. That's absolutely brilliant. That's a massive volume of data that's openly available. That's the two things that stand out. Metadata, geospatial data, textual data, four million polygons. It, it is a massive work. Done by yeah, um, bright, bright minds. We have a lot of fun when, when, whenever we have to do like a national kind of update sure. or something. We always have sure. fun like with GIS crashing and yep. all these yep. things. And so I get right. the, uh, the coding expert to get in the back end and sort of do some queries. And, yeah. I, I, can, I can imagine. Well, there's been yeah. a, a fair bit of activity and background as, you, as you've been speaking. Lots of, lots of questions are coming up right now. So maybe we'll jump right into those. Um, but before I start, your experience as uh, attendees and listeners is really cru crucial in this process. It's, it's, as Ben said, it's a mutual, mutual building process. So we'd be really interested to hear from you and the way you've used this uh, GDE data, Atlas of GDE data. We, we'd be interested and so would Ben and, and uh, Eloise and their colleagues. So um, by all means, uh, fire us an email about the way you, you've used it and maybe we can uh, progress that down track into, into other webinars. We can take yeah. those experiences into other webinars, which might be useful uh, uh, widely. Anyway, right, let's get going. Daniela from Chile, uh, University of Concepcion, uh, says, I wanted to know if the methodologies that are used to map GDEs can be ex done exclusively with satellite products just thinking about the scarce data on GDEs. Um, so I'm, I'm not really had anything to do with the development of sure. GDEs themselves. Um, I, mean, I don't know if you can do it exclusively with satellite imagery. I know that you can certainly use it as a supplementary data set, but maybe Eloise has a better idea. Yeah, so I think 
Um, the data that we've got in the Atlas, as Ben was explaining, is a combination of the national assessment and also um, more recent data that's come from regional studies. Um, so the, the GDEs have been mapped using a combination of approaches. Some of them have um, been just based almost entirely on satellite imagery um, and others don't use satellite imagery at all. So there's a real sort of combination of approaches. And I think one of the things we'd really like to do is start to um, maybe do a, a bit of a review of all the GDA mapping approaches that are out there right. and try and what the, what the best approach is for different circumstances and depending on the available data. Um, but at the moment, we don't have that sort of oversight as to, you know, what's the best approach for different um, situations. Yep. Yeah. No, that's, that sounds good. That's great. Uh, your feedback, once again, would be useful. Now, the question that's got the most uh, upvotes, and by all means, people keep keep upvoting which questions you'd like to see next, but um, it's uh, from, I don't know, anonymous attendee. Congratulations on this globally leading initiative. I fully agree. What are the prospects for adapting the Atlas for use in developing countries? Is there any work being done to adapt the Atlas uh, to developing country conditions and needs? Well, um, so we're not currently working, um, we haven't really been scoping that out actually in terms of applying that mm -hmm. internationally. Um, but I think for, you know, the national assessment, because it was computer based and like sort of desktop based, it's probably something that could economically be done um, in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and it uses a lot of satellite imagery and that sort of thing, as Eloise said. Um, but I mean, that's something. I'd be quite interested to, if anyone wants to get in touch with us and maybe we can put you in touch with the right people, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's a great idea and we'd be very happy to share our learnings mm. with, um, with people from other countries. Yep. So I guess if, um, yeah, if anyone plans to do that in their country, please get in yep. contact with groundwater.bomb.com.au. Yep. Yeah, no, I, that... just say, I just want to add, you know, this is sort of like a public good initiative and yep. we, as, as for the benefit of the country and mm. everyone else, so yeah. we're always willing to share our learnings and, and mm. our data and, you know, as much as we practically can. No, that's fantastic. Mm. And, and Mikhail, really Colin and... With people. Yeah, sharing with people, yeah. Uh, Mikhail has said, thank you very much. Atlas is very important for all countries. That's absolutely... Uh, absolutely true. Thanks for your comment. Um, next one. Um, this looks great. Are we able to access the calculation of potentials in the GD Atlas Phase 2 Task 5 report? And is there a handy link to that report? Uh, yes. Um, I don't have that handy link on me at the moment, but um, I, it, it was at the bottom of that image of the report. Um, it is on our website. So if you if you okay. go to our GD Atlas um, and then on the methodology tab, if you go into that, um, right. The report are uh, listed there. Right. So two reports, I believe, the part one and part two. Yep. No worries. And if there's any questions on that, don't hesitate, everyone, to fire us an email, and we'll uh, we'll be on to Ben and look. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can Eloise. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Um, Sarah Bolter, uh, I think, is from. Um, um, how did he? Yes. Yes. Yep, Southport, Queensland, NCARF. Oh, yeah, really good. Um, she's mentioned, is there a potential to include future information? Uh, oh, yes, of course, from NCARF, that's right, i.e. climate projections. If someone has modelled or explored that. Yeah, I possibly. think, um, so currently we're sort of more focusing on automating our update processes and getting that a bit more streamlined. Um, and then that'll free us up to do a bit more analysis and kind of see how we can do some more value adding to the atlas um mm. so we are kind of working on a bit of a strategic framework mm. where we kind of talk about additional data sets or things that would be useful so um yeah so i guess the short answer is it, we'd be interested in that but probably as, as it stands right now not so much but um we, we're always looking for how we can improve the atlas yep. uh, going forward yeah, it just seemed like a good um, a good direction. Um, uh, Jill White, um, Scientific Officer at Department of Water and Environment Regulation in WA, Western Australia, looking at the, Jill says, that looking at the aquatic GDE layer in Western Australia, the national assessment mapping appears to have been done at different scales. Hmm. 
Um, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the different scales, but certainly, well, it, we, um, they've incorporated um, lots of different spatial data sets, and so each of those data sets will um, will have different scales. So probably that's what what um, she's yep. saying. Yes. Um, the, mm. the other thing is that um, we're actually currently working with that department in WA to do some uh -huh. updates for three regions. So maybe right. in um, six to eight months, you'll see some new data in there for WA. Yeah, and that's one of the strengths that you pointed out, Then we're working with that department. There's probably Absolutely. tons of more in that category. Uh, um, Gil White goes on to say, please, can you explain the data sources used for national mapping? Why would some areas be mapped uh, with very fine resolution right next to an area of much lower resolution? Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to what Alois was saying. Yeah. I mean, they just did a review of all the data sets that were available. Um, so I think it's more just limited to what the, what data was there. Um, yeah. So if they had fine, you know, higher resolution data, then obviously they're going to go with that. But then if you, if you don't have great data, then um, obviously the resolution is not going to be as great. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dan Evans is with Becca in Sydney. I always have trouble getting the um, identity tool to generate a listing of features in the search results area of the web page. Uh, the search results sub page opens up, which doesn't include the export function. Any tips? Um, I, I mean, I haven't heard of this issue. So maybe for Becca wants to just get in touch with us. Yep. Like on what yep. um, she, we can certainly work with her to try and find out what the problem is. There may be other people experiencing that. Have you had any kind no, of I, I inquiries? No, um, I haven't heard about that one, but maybe we can do some testing ourselves um, and then we can get back to, to Dan and yep. um, see what we can find out. What, but that, thank that, you for letting us know because we're, yep. we, um, yeah, we're always um, wanting to deliver the best you know, experience with the product. Absolutely. And, and look, Dan, that's exactly what these webinars and everybody, that's all it's about, really. If, if you're making some input, then we can make some benefit to this high community good um, GDE database here. Marilyn Quintaro says, um, when was the last data update for Western Australia? Oh. Mm. Um, so we haven't, is this going to be the first one that we've done? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we haven't actually done one yet for WA, but as we mentioned before, we are um, working on an update at the moment. Um, and so they, they've done a bit of GDE mapping in a few different areas. So we're kind of just working with them at the moment to, I guess, standardize the data to the Atlas um, and then before we can ingest it. So we have to work pretty closely with them to work out, you know, how did they develop that data um, and what field mapped with our schema and, you know, how, how we go about um, aligning it, I guess. So, yeah. yeah, so in the next six to eight months, we'll have an update. So hopefully early to mid 2019. Yeah, yeah that's great. Right, no. In there currently comes from um, 2010 to 2012. Right. From the national assessment. Right. right. That's, that's great. Uh, Ross Best is with Coffee in Sydney. Thanks for the presentation, says Ross. I noticed there was a reference to board data on the Atlas. What information is contained in this part and how does it relate to groundwater dependent ecosystems? Uh, so at the moment we've got um, I think it's just both classified by their use. We don't actually have groundwater levels of that information in there as yet. Um, so water, having water table data is something we're looking into um, because a lot of people are asking for it. Um, hmm. I guess it's just, um, we have to work out how, how do we, because we're working with different data sets, how do we not lead to incorrect interpretation by having different temporal kind of data set, you know, over different times. So we're just trying to work out the best way forward with that. And so that's something we're talking with the reference group about as well. Um, do we have any other information on board apart from No, the so user? that, I mean, it's just the location and the purpose of the bores, and then um, all of the attributes about each of the bores. And so it clearly shows up which bores are used for um, extraction and irrigation and things yep. like that. And the idea about showing those is we're showing sites that, um, you know, extraction sites, uh, sites extracting groundwater, you know, that could potentially impact on GDEs. Yep. Great. We're up to 45 minutes and uh, we're s zooming through these questions. But a couple more to go here from uh, one from Felicity Muller uh, in uh, Sydney National, Natural Resources Commission. Um, 
uh, Felicity is a senior advisor there. Uh, does the metadata capture the methodologies used to capture GDEs for regionally provided data? Uh, not in the metadata. So we do have um, a, a field within the GDE data set um, with a link to the source information. So <clears throat> I guess the idea is that you would just kind of click on the, the links provided or the, um, you know, we give the reference and then you would go, go to that and you would find the information on how the data was collected. Yeah. So yeah. the other thing is that um, when we do the next um, update to the Atlas, we do want to provide more of that um, documentation. Mm. So a data product specification, um, more metadata and a data dictionary. So it will have all of those links to the, the regional <laughs> studies so people can yep. access. Yep, yeah. no, that's great. Uh, Katie Colborne, Colborne in Sydney, UNSW in Sydney, a graduate researcher. Uh, great presentation. What criteria do you use to choose data from regional studies to update the atlas? Is there a way to notify you of regional data sets that exist, which may not currently be included? Um, yeah, so there's a couple of things to that. Um, obviously, we have the GDE reference group. Um, where we talk to the major GDE data custodians, um, so the lead state water agencies and other Commonwealth agencies that collect data as well. Um, now, they're, they're the experts in the field. They, they know much more about GDE than I do. Um, so we, we work with them, and if they say, you know, we have this data available and it's really reliable, um, and, you know, we think it should be on the Atlas, then we'll work with them to get that um, uploaded. So we really rely on their knowledge more than ours um, in order to decide what, what data is suitable. Um, that we do recognise, so this is, this is something we're grappling with at the moment, we do recognise that a lot of GDE data being collected um, from a variety of different sources, so you know like when all these consulting companies are doing impact assessments and all these different agencies collecting GDE data um, so there's a lot of information kind of just sitting there, filed away, that's not getting ingested into the Atlas. So we are, yeah, we need to think a bit more about how we can sort of reach those people um, and, and sort of get that data happening. And we're talking about um, maybe developing an upload tool where mm. people can upload their data and then we can sort of sift through it and, you know, kind of work it into the Atlas. Um, but that's a little while off. Um, but I guess raising awareness, like this webinar and that sort of thing, getting, getting it on people's radar, um, and maybe that'll kind of help open the channels of communication to the different sources. Well, uh, is, there a, is there an interface? Sorry, Eloise, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, because um, Katie was saying, is there a way to notify us about Yeah, it? that's what I was getting at, yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say, um, if she, she could just send us an email to groundwater at bomb.gov.au. So that's the one on the, on the chat line there right now? One. And yeah. um, so what we do, given, um, so whichever state it was for, we liaise with the um, GDE experts in that state and say to them, you know, do, do you think this is the, um, the best available data for your state? Are you happy for us to include that in the atlas? So there'd be a bit of a um, negotiation. Um, all working together with the state to, to incorporate that data. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks a lot, Katie. That was a, that was a crucial um, crucial question there. A um, couple to go, and then we'll call today. Um, one about downloading this presentation. Give us a yell, and we'll send it off to you in a yep in a secure PDF. Uh, Reza uh, says, a "Great presentation. There are many GDEs throughout Australia, which are, which some some of which have been studied, and some not yet." For the GDEs which have been studied, for example, by students and researchers, there are lots of available data, published articles, postgraduate theses, but these data have not been added to the Atlas. Who's responsible to search these available free data and add it to the Atlas? For example, water caves in Wellington, New South Wales, Australia. You've probably had this question, a similar question before, but thanks a lot, Reza. That's, that's a really good question. Uh, others have uploaded it, I see there too. So, yeah, the question is, how do you get this data in? <laughs> no, no. I know um, during the original GDE Atlas project, they did um, actually um, search through some of the available literature and actually map those known GDEs um, from different literature sources. So they did um, do, do quite a bit of that, um, that literature review work. We haven't been doing any of that um, ourselves recently because, you know, it's, uh, it takes a lot of work to, yeah. to be doing that yeah. sort of work. Yeah. 
But again, if people um, are willing to, to share their data with us and put it in a, a format that makes it very easy for us to upload, then we're, yeah, I'm sure we can, we can look into putting it into the atlas. Yeah, I just want to add, um, like unlike other water data, um, that is legislated that they have to deliver it to the Bureau um, and they have the funding for that. Um, GDA data is not covered under that sort of legislation. Right. So um, any resources that we dedicate to it, um, that's sort of coming out of our own time, um, that's not really got a separate bucket of funding for it or anything like that. So, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can with the resources we have. No, absolutely brilliant, yeah. Uh, couple to go. Thanks for the great presentation. What is the best way to obtain the underlying data set supporting GDE identification? I think I'll take the input data set. Sounds like it. Mm -hmm. um, do we, we don't really provide that, do we, for the national assessment? Um, um, so some of, the, um, some of the input data sets are in the GDE Atlas as contextual layers. Right. Um, but um, if there were specific data sets that 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 um, person was interested in, they could um, send us an email to groundwater yep. and yep. go there and we could see um, yep. if it's possible for us to share them. Yep. Yeah. So that seems to be the best way to get uh, yes. conne connections happening. Groundwater at bomb.gov.au. That's it. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna leave it there, uh, but I can see from your presentation, Ben, there's future thinking GDE toolbox updates and improvements. Uh, but let's leave it there, shall we? There's, there's, there's so much more we could say about this. But, I'll, but a couple of comments here. Mikhail uh, Kalanin says, I will definitely tell about this experience to students at Geography Department of Belarusian State University. Uh, thanks again. That's a pretty strong um, uh, statement of support and an outstanding presentation by Ben and Eloise from Islam Al-Haq. So thanks both of you for your kind words. And um, mostly, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Eloise. And for everyone who's been listening, we're just delighted that you've uh, joined us today. We've made it a really interesting conversation. Um, a very big group has joined us. Um, thanks for participating. Feedback survey will come up next, and then we'll send you the recording, of, uh, a, a link to the recording. There's the free webinars there, plenty of them, and some online courses you may be interested. Uh, subscribe to YouTube and to Twitter. Uh, you'll find out a lot more there. Thanks uh, from my end to uh, Joel Altman and uh, Michelle Ha here at Ice Warm Australian Water School, uh, been um, uh, so ably supporting this uh, this webinar. Uh, production and the weekly production that we that we do each week. Most of all, thank to you, Ben. Thank you to Eloise. And we can probably say bye for now, I think. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Eloise. See you later. Yep. See you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com dot au